Welcome to the Runway to Reiki podcast with Fashionista Yogi, where we will be having conversations surrounding wellness and inspiration for creatives. I'm the host, Susan Higgins. I hope you all are doing so well as you're listening to this episode. I'm so excited to share the second part of my interview with Brandy Russell Wallace with you. Get ready because there is a lot of info in this episode and Brandy really gives so much of her story, even the painful parts, which I'm so grateful to her for being so open and vulnerable about her experiences in hopes that she may help one of you by sharing her experiences. With no further delay, let's get into this interview, kings and queens. I remember I was in Dubai for my birthday and I received calls and texts from Mr. Jeff, Mm -hmm. child out ring shopping. (laughs) I'm in Dubai trying to live my best life (laughs) and this man is panicking. I need you. Can we talk? Can I... Like, what can we, like, look, I'm sorry, I'm in Dubai living it up, (laughs) sir. But I ended up figuring it out, making time for him, and we worked out whatever questions he had for me about this ring situation. Oh, bless you. (laughs) (laughs) And so, probably a month later, he proposed to you. Yeah. Tell us about that. So, Jeff and I, we met in Dallas. I usually go out of town or go somewhere special for every single birthday. This particular year for my birthday, I didn't go anywhere. It kind of was kind of last minute. I just didn't go anywhere. And so a friend of mine texted me and said, hey, let's just go out for your birthday. And so we went out to a kind of Sunday fun day party and in walks in this like super cute, like really different looking guy. I mean, these guys tattoos on his forearm. He's wearing like some cut off shorts. He just didn't look like the particular like Dallas guy. He yeah. looked like, you know, he was kind of into skateboarding. You know, he looked a little like different. Alternative. Yeah, he looked like a little alternative. Like he was real cute. He's you know? a little hipster. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I like him. Black hipster boy. Yeah. I was like, I like him. And so I positioned myself at the bar because I kind of thought maybe he'll come to the bar and he did. And then we started talking and then like we never stopped talking. So that's kind of how we met. Fast forward to two years later, Jeff was going through cha- uh, converting to be to be Catholic. Right. Oh. So he was taking classes and learning, you know, the religion. And also um, so I also was taking them with him because I kind of just wanted a refresher. And do you are Catholic? I am Catholic. Okay. Yes. Um, he did not convert for me, but it's something that he wanted to do and he suggested. So I said, sure, you know, I'll do it with you. And I also signed up to be his godmother. So his sponsor is what we call it, but technically I'm like his godmother. Okay. So during that weekend, which was Easter weekend, I just like knew, like I thought, you know, Maybe like he's gonna propose to me because like this like he's getting baptized right. Mm-hmm. It's a special day and everyone's gonna be there. So it was on a Saturday. He got baptized Saturday evening. I wore my Michelle dress, by the way, um, to the baptism. Yes, I was there. Yes, <laughs> and so I just like knew this was gonna happen. However, it did not happen, and <laughs> I wasn't disappointed at all or anything. I just thought maybe it would be a time when he would propose, but it didn't happen. So I kind of just like. Put it to the back of my mind. Didn't really think about it. Next day, Easter Sunday, we go eat at my family's house, just with all of my extended family, and and it didn't happen there either. I don't think at that point I didn't think it was going to happen anytime soon because if it didn't happen at the baptism, then it wasn't going to happen. So I just kind of put it out of my mind, and it didn't. It didn't really happen until we got back home. Um, to the house that we lived in and it was just me and him and it was just like so perfect. You know, he told me something very sweet and then like, I was so surprised. I was so surprised. It was like, I cannot believe he's actually proposing to me now. Like we were just like talking, like we were just like laying in bed talking and then, you know, 
I got up to go do something and came back and there he was. Oh, for real? Yeah. He was just like on one knee? Um, He did not get on one knee until he actually asked me. Then he got down on one knee. Okay. So he, he was just standing there with the ring? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. so sweet. Yeah. So I remember, child, the next day, like us just being so excited. Yes. And child, you went into planning mode. I cannot believe. She, it's I, I honestly, <laughs> I cannot believe how quickly I pulled that together. Girl. So we had a six month engagement. Yes. And we had an elaborate wedding. Yes. Which also consist, consisted on consisted of several events leading up to we had an engagement party. We had I had a bachelorette. Bachel- bachelorette party. We had the rehearsal dinner, which was like a big rehearsal dinner. And you had a bridal shower. A bridal shower. Mm-hmm. We literally had something to do every single month mm-hmm. up until the the wedding. Yes. So that was I can't believe I I honestly pulled that together so fast. Girl, like what I remember is just how on top of it you were in like the diagrams and the charts <laughs> and like the planner situations as if you were a licensed wedding planner and been doing it for years. And I was like, damn, girl, can you do it all for real? <laughs> and I was like, damn, you may as well just go into the bridal planning business next. I, I mean, mean, what's stopping you? What's stopping you? I mean... It was fun to do because it was my own. Yes. I don't know that it would be fun to do for someone else. I was also very, very decisive. You know? Yes. I was like, okay, those are the flowers. That it is was that boom, is the boom, venue. Boom. Yeah. Once I decided on something, that was it. I went into like designing the invitations, designing like we had an engagement photo shoot. We had everything was like ticked and tied, scheduled and done. Yes. I feel like just the way you approach that, like your design experience mm-hmm. and also your math experience mm-hmm. played a big role in how you were able to pull, like you literally designed your wedding. Yes, absolutely. I designed every detail. I made a logo. I designed the invitations. I designed every single corresponding detail that we had for everything. So that was, it was pretty fun to do. And also, like, with me designing it, I had the final say of what it should look like, you know? Right. Jeff would chime in every once in a while, but he kind of just, like, gave me free reign, which was really good. Good. Yeah. Man, I remember I was—you chose me to be one of your bridesmaids, and it wasn't like I was one of your, like, lifelong friends. It was, like, I'd me- it was 2015. I'd met you in 2011, mm-hmm. and I was really kind of surprised that you asked me almost— Just because I'm like, dang, like she got all these girlfriends and, you know, college girlfriends. And then she's asking me and she's known me for years. I was really like, oh, my God, like, thank you. So sweet. Like, what made you choose me? Well, I think it's really important to choose people that are direct impacts of your relationship and that are really involved in your relationship. Yeah, I have a lot of lifelong friends. I've got people that I've probably known for you know, most of my life, but they may not have ever even known Jeff. Right. You know, they weren't the person that he called when he was asking like about a ring. Like, so I thought that that was so special and you're such an integral part of our relationship that how could you, how could I not have you standing next to me? And girl, that year for me definitely was super fun. We did the engagement party And we threw you that bachelorette party in Miami, which was so lit. lit. So lit. I mean, that was, that was amazing. One for the books, right? (laughs) That was definitely one for the books. That's like the last hurrah. (laughs) Last hurrah. And then we did your Chanel themed bridal shower. Which was so perfect and so beautiful. Yes. I love doing it all, man. I was honored um, that you asked me. But I will say, child, I was tired (laughs) as F <laughs> after all that child and I'm sure I don't think I've accepted being a bridesmaid again since because I wore myself out. <laughs> I'm I, sorry, I no, ruined no. your experience. <laughs> but it was dope. But child, I was I was bridesmaids out after that. Mm-hmm. I said I need a break from bridesmaid. Oh, yeah. But because it was fast, I mean, we didn't realize like it was a six month engagement, yeah. and then the wedding was a big wedding and very detailed. Yeah, it was very intense, but. The, it's great memories when I look back at it all. Very great. Just and so, amazing. And 
also, during all of that, in designing every detail of the wedding, I also designed the bridesmaids' dresses. You did. Which Facts. was, like, so fun to do. And it was something that, you know, I'd done for other people. So, I mean, it was obvious that I should definitely do it for myself. So Yes. And you were going to design your own dress, your bridal dress. Oh, and then yes. I remember you put, we kind of put the brakes on that. Yes. So, you and I, see, I had you go with me. <laughs> My designer friend and my bridesmaid, I had you go with me to go try on bride, uh, wedding gowns. And because really the intention was for you to like study the details and take pictures and do my measurements so that we can actually design it and send out a tech pack so that, you know, I to can actually, yeah, actually get this made for me. But then like the second dress we tried on, it was so perfect that why would I even need to recreate that? No, I was like, girl, no. This like, is it. This is it. We're the, this is done. This is like the dress that I wanted. This is the dress that I'm... And the price like wasn't even like cray cray. It wasn't. So that was done. Yeah. One less thing for me to do. Yes. So you got... Now you're married. Mm-hmm. You're still working corporate. Mm-hmm. You're running your business. Mm-hmm. And you now are wanting children. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey in wanting children? Yes. So I am... The bonus mom, we like to say bonus mom, to 11-year-old Chloe. Um, That was actually one of the things that attracted me to Jeff when we first met is that he was so proud of Chloe and he was like so integral in her life. And he was telling me about the private school she went to. Like that was our first like conversation. Um, And so I loved like seeing like just such a good daddy. Yeah. So that kind of just like really attracted me to him. So when we got married, I knew that I wanted to, you know, grow our family more. Of course, me being the planner that I am, I kind of had, you know, I had it all kind of mapped out in the way that I thought it should go. Um, but God had other plans. So um, it took me a little bit longer than I thought that I wanted it to take. But actually, the twins came at the perfect time and they are the perfect addition to our family, and they just kind of completed our whole little unit. So Mm -hmm. we're so grateful for them. And, you know, pregnancy, twin pregnancy, of course, was hard. (laughs) Um, But I had a lot of fun being pregnant. I just, like, it was so fun, like, growing lives in my womb. And just, you know, that is, like, that is prayer like you never prayed before. You know, it is, like, I don't know. I just felt so close, just so close with God. And I just was so prayerful that, you know, the twins came when they were supposed to come and they were healthy and, you know, it just was a safe delivery for us. So I'm so grateful that it was and they came perfectly. So um, it was it was very fun. But those last few weeks were miserable, mm-hmm. I have to say. That was kind of miserable. But, you know, I tried to make the best of it as I usually do. What was the most challenging part of going from being a single woman to a married woman while still holding down a corporate job and your business? Um, Pre-kids. Pre-kids, just just transitioning from the independent, I've got this, I could do it type of person to, to, number one, asking for help. Number two, letting someone help me. You know, that was hard Mm. because I had gone, you know, I was in Atlanta and New York by myself. I opened all my jars. I carried stuff upstairs, boxes. I put stuff together. And now, you know, it's a time like when you get married, like you have to transition to like, you know what? I need to, I don't have to do it all. And I can't do it all. But I also need to let my husband know that I need him. Yes. I really do need him. So, you know, that's kind of a hard transition to do as an independent, like, Black, I've got this woman. Yeah. You know? What advice do you have to single women in, you know, acting accordingly and on what way even landing that husband or even once you do, like, what are those adjustments they need to make? Do you have any tips I say being independent and being strong-willed is all great, but 
I feel like you need to give a man a reason to want to help you. Mm-hmm. You need to give a man a reason to want to be a man. I know those those things are like people don't like to say those kind of things nowadays with all right. the, the gender roles, movement, yeah, all that stuff. But you know, there's something about a man wanting to be a man, right? And you know, and for me, for me, just like wanting to be a woman, yes. you know, there are things that I can do as a woman that he can't. I can birth children, you know, I can feed children from my body, Amen. and that he can't do. So. I'm okay with you just letting me sit here and feed my children mm-hmm. while you go do stuff that men do, yes. you know? So I think it's it's okay to kind of release that, like, I have to do it all. I have to, you know, take care of this and build this and, you know, wear the pants, so to yes. speak. But basically letting go. Letting go. And surrendering to the process yes. and letting that man do some things yes, too. Yes. Being okay with asking for help. Exactly. And it's and it's no signal that you are not strong and you're not capable and you're not, you know, where you need to be. It's just letting go. Yes. Now tell me, ooh, girl, <laughs> tell me about being pregnant with twins, being in a very demanding, intense corporate environment, having your business and now a husband. So That was really, really hard. I'll say that I, during that time, I was able to really like shift my focus and shift my energy to not getting myself worked up. I was able to really like, for lack of a better word, just like not give a F. Yeah. Just like I'm, I'm baking children. That is my number one goal. That's my number one role. So if if I'm not moving fast enough for you, or if I'm not doing something to your liking, I'm working on something. Yeah. I'm busy right now. So, I mean, and some people didn't like it. Some people did. Some people didn't like it. That's that's kind of how it was at my corporate job. Yeah. And then with my business, I made the distinct decision to kind of just taper some things off. I I learned to say no. I had to say no. There were some things I just couldn't fulfill because I was either going to be delivering two babies at that time that, that they wanted that product, or I was going to be nursing two babies or something like that. So I had to say no to some projects and some some orders had to just, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't fulfill them all. And that was okay, you know? Right. So that year I didn't probably make as much as I had done the previous year or the year after, but I was okay with kind of scaling back just a little bit. Um it was also a year that I really relied heavily on my assistant to help me. Um, my assistant that has worked with me for over like the past 10 years, and she's been phenomenal. Miss Chandler, shout out to yes, you. Yes, shout out to Chandler. She's like an artist. She's living in Atlanta, just like doing her whole Black Girl Magic thing and just like really thriving. I'm so proud of her. I had to let her go to Atlanta, leave me, but she's like thriving and just really, really becoming who she really is destined to be. And I'm so super proud of her. So shout out to her. So, but during the time that I was pregnant, I just relied heavily on, you know, having her do a lot of stuff for the business and she, you know, executed flawlessly and really helped me out. So I'm so grateful for her contribution to the team during that time. And how did you handle, were there any ways that you had to be any different or any challenges with your husband while you were pregnant? Um, I think that's more of, of a question of how he had to be different with me mm. because I was super hormonal. Um, your hormones are just like, you know, very sensitive when you are carrying lives. Um, so at any given moment, like he would just, he would just have to just be on call for me, you know? And so he was so supportive. So I think I didn't necessarily have to be any, anything different because I kind of just got a pass Yeah, because I was carrying the lives, but he really had to kind of just adapt and kind of just go with the flow with me, which I'm very thankful for because he was very supportive you know, I would be in so much pain and he would be, you know, running a bath water or like 
cooking me whatever I wanted to eat or whatever I feel like I could eat at the time. Right. You know, he was just like super supportive. He kind of just let me do me and be, you know, crying or upset or happy or whatever I wanted to be. He just right. kind of let me. And I'm thankful that he just kind of let me because that essentially allowed me to just bake these children, you know, the way that they needed to be baked. That's amazing. That's all any girl could dream of, right? Yeah, for real. So then now you have kids, three of them. Mm -hmm. You're out on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And now you are handling taking care of two newborns at the same damn time. Same damn time. So let's discuss that. How did you handle that? You know, it's kind of a blur because during those first few weeks postpartum, you're just kind of like jump jumping into a role that you never knew what to do and you're just doing. So I just kind of like did it, you know? I didn't sleep very much. I was nursing the twins. I was still like handling small things, small business needs, you know? I wasn't doing too much, but I was doing a couple like small business needs. I was I had to, the, the show must go on. People were still emailing me, so I had to respond to people. So, so yeah, it was, you know, you really don't know how little sleep you can operate on until you have kids. Hmm. And I just, I operated, I woke up, I went straight into like mommy mode, feeding the twins and kind of just like doing the things that need to be done in the house. And then I had like so much help. Um, everyone's not as lucky or as blessed as, as I am um, in that I had my mom come over. And she still comes over a couple of times a week to help me out. And then my mother-in-law, she practically like came over every single day to help me during the day. So awesome. yeah, I mean, she kept, she actually came over while I was like on bed rest. So she had been coming over like my whole like last few weeks of pregnancy and then into after the twins were born and she was over every single day helping me. So, you know, I could, I do feel like I could take a nap. You know, I didn't really, but I do feel like I could have if I wanted to. Um, so I, I would take a nap when the twins slept or when I wasn't nursing them, which was like never. Right. Because <laughs> always either yeah. one was hungry or the other. Right? One, yeah. Somebody was always hungry. Right. <laughs> How long were you on um, bed rest prior to having the babies? So I I stopped working at 31 weeks and my doctor didn't necessarily say I needed to go on bed rest, but she just said, you need to like not do anything. You need to sit down. You need bed. to sit down. Yeah. So so for those six weeks before the twins were born, I was sitting down at home. Mm-hmm. Which, Good. yeah, I mean, that's that's probably the only, you know, it's probably part of the big reason why they were just okay to just be, you know, I couldn't even, I, I couldn't drive without my stomach touching the steering wheel. Right. Yeah, so, that's why you're pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's discuss your transition back to work mm-hmm. after maternity leave. How did you feel? How did you do it? I didn't want to go. I really didn't want to go. I dropped those twins off at daycare that first day and I rounded the corner and I cried. I was so upset to be leaving them, number one. And to be going back into the corporate world, I wanted to just like stay home with these two lives. I mean, it's been 90 days. They haven't even like, they can, they can't do anything, you know, yeah. like it's, it's absurd that we should have to go back to work, you know, that quickly, that quickly. So I was really, really sad, although I did at the same time feel rejuvenated in a sense. Because I had, you know, the six weeks before and then I had um, the 12 weeks after the twins were born. So I felt if I were going to go back, I felt at least rejuvenated about my job enough to feel like, okay, I'm, it's a new, it's a new job. It's a new experience for me. I'm going to go into this with a really positive mind and I'm not going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to be happy about being here. If I'm going to be here, I'm going to be happy about being here. So I think that was refreshing because I feel I kind of feel like people need that. Like even if you don't have a baby, you just like need that break. Right. Um, I've been walking into the same doors for the past ten years, like every single day. You need right. a break from that. Yes. So there's that. And then 
there's just the working mom, the nursing, you know, pumping and, you know, all of that. It just, it also changes how you operate in a corporate mindset. Like the no more late nights. I got, it's time to go. I've Mm got to go. Or I've got to go feed my children. I'm just, I'm not available. Right. Like there's no if, ands, or buts. There's nope, no rules. Like I'm just, you just have to be very, very like strict about what your intentions are for yourself and, you know, and, and stick to them. So I was very, very um, particular about doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of helped, but also it, I had to create my own work life balance. Yeah. I don't think anyone creates it for you. And people certainly won't volunteer to tell you how to do it. You just have to create it yourself. Okay. So I said, I am not working past this time. I am not available. I am not, period. I'm not checking my emails at night, not doing it. It can wait. You know, I'm not saving a life here. No. So they can wait. Mm hmm. So I had to do that so that I can create my own work-life balance so that I can have time at night with my children, you know, just us, with my family, eating dinner, whatever we're doing, uninterrupted. Yes. You know, so you have to just kind of create that for yourself. Amazing. So how long did you breastfeed for? 12 months, a whole year. Okay, so one whole year. Mm -hmm. And I remember you just slaying it and— us just being so proud of you. (laughs) I remember you telling me (laughs) that you were multitasking because your commute was ignorant, like a good hour commute Mm -hmm. to the office. Yep. And you told me that you were pumping in the car on the way to work. Oh yeah. I would pump two on the way to work, on the way from work. And then once during the day, see, I had a lot of bottles to make for daycare. So I had to make, you know, a good 64 ounces of milk. And you weren't Every mixing day. formula not at that time at all. Not so at that when time. did you start adding in formula? Not until they were probably about like six months. Okay, and just like just sparingly, only when I couldn't do enough, if I didn't have enough time to pump, if I didn't have enough milk. Um, but for the most part, um, I didn't really have to. And we started doing it a little bit later, just so that they would sleep a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. So that kind of helped, but not really. So now you working, breastfeeding, taking care of three kids, mm-hmm. running your business, mm-hmm. halfway. <laughs> How did you keep yourself together and not have a breakdown? <laughs> Who said I didn't have a breakdown? <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, I just, there's, you just do, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, if anybody knows more than I do, Black women know, you just do. Yes. Like, we are given a lot of circumstances. We are given a lot of challenges and we just figure it out. Yes, and yeah. so I figured out what works for me. You know, again, I had to do the no. I had to understand the power of no. Mm. You know, some people would say, can you can you travel overseas? No, I can't. Not Not right now. No, ma'am. No, I can't. I had clients that were asking me to do stuff and I could do it, but normally I would have done it in maybe a two or three hour turnaround. Right. I started setting better expectations for myself. They're more realistic. More boundaries. More boundaries. Like I can get that to you in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still fair. Right. You know, this is not like Burger King. Like I, you're not, it's not, I'm not a drive through service. So. I'm going to like give myself some boundaries and some time to complete stuff. And that's enough. That's all I can do. Amen. Okay. This may be a tough question. You may not want to answer it. You just let me know. Did you suffer from postpartum? And if how did you overcome that if you did? Yes, I did. I suffered from postpartum. And I will be the first person to tell people that it is so common it is so much more common than we think or than we acknowledge. And it's really not fair to make people think that it doesn't happen. Right. It happens for most women. Right. And it's okay. You know, a couple of my friends, you know, told me 
how they felt. My, my best friend told me, she was like, most women have this. You're, you're okay. It's mm-hmm. okay to have it. Mm-hmm. It's okay to cry. It's yeah. okay to be upset. And sometimes people think that postpartum is like you're sitting in a closet and you want to kill your children. That's not what it is. Right. It is the balance of getting your, your hormones back in check and understanding that there's a whole new life and a whole new component to your life that you are completely responsible for. And that difference of how that affects you, it, it affects everyone very differently. Right. And some people may feel very irritable, mm-hmm. you know? People feel very, sometimes people feel very sad. And, and that's okay. Those feelings are okay to have and they're completely normal to have. I mean, I remember I was so irritable, you know? I had postpartum depression in the sense that I wasn't necessarily like sad and crying all the time, but I was so irritable. Everything got on my nerves. Mm. And it was everyone else that really got on my nerves. Okay. You know, and not even the twins. The twins really didn't even get it. Like they were cool. Right. It was just like everybody else. And I'm, I was so like snippy mm-hmm. and snappy at everyone. Mm-hmm. So that was... That was something I had to really like come to terms with, really acknowledge. You know, I I went to my checkup from my doc, you know, my six week checkup, and my doctor asked me, "How are you doing?" And I couldn't even answer. I broke down. Oh. I I couldn't even like answer. So from that point on, like she knew, she obviously knew, and she said, "You could get through this." She said, "You could you could definitely get through this." You know, she gave me some some things to do, you know, ways to kind of decompress. Mm -hmm. She gave me, you know, things to kind of think about. Meditation, you know, Mm -hmm. natural supplements, Mm -hmm. you know, and and that helped. I can honestly say that helped. And it helped me like reframe and retrain my mind and kind of know, understand what my new normal was going to feel like. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't fair for me to be snappy to other people, but also I have to give myself a pass and a chance to readjust my hormones. Right. Give yourself the grace. Yeah. Right. That's great. I'm so happy that you did what you had to do to come through that. Oh, yeah. Thank you for talking about that. Of course. So many women go through that and are open about it. And I feel like something that we really need to discuss together as women to make sure that we all know it's okay and we all go through it. Oh, yes. So now we're going to talk about something a little bit heavy. Soon after this, your 2018 was pretty rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You lost your father mm-hmm. and one of your best friends who you've referenced a lot actually in this podcast on yeah. designing her wedding gowns and mm-hmm. even her helping you through your postpartum. Oh, yeah. Casey, it, it was a very sudden loss mm-hmm. and you lost them very close together all in the summer of 18. Mm-hmm. How did you get through that and, again, keep it all together while managing all that you had going on in your life now with these two new babies that aren't even a year old? Yeah. How did you get through that? You know, I honestly, like, God's grace is so, it's it's such a thing. Like, God gives us grace to be able to get through these things. Like, he He helps us. Like, I was not... I don't think I would have been able to get through if I did not have God, if I mm-hmm. did not have the, sh- I couldn't rely on him. And just being able to be open and talk about stuff, you know, my husband was really, really good. You know, he's always been so supportive of me, but he was like my rock. You know, he was like, he allowed me to just really like lean on him for those moments. You know, he, he just like would hold me, you know? Yeah. So those those things like really kind of honestly help me get through. You know, grief is like it's hard. Grief is really really hard. And to lose two people that were super close to me, um so close to one another, it it was really really hard for me. Yeah. And someone says, I read this I think on Facebook that grief is like a room with a really big ball, right? Sometimes when it first happens, the ball 
is touching all four walls. And then as you go through the years, that ball gets smaller, Mm -hmm. but it still hits all those Mm -hmm. walls. Just the time in between it hitting those walls is spaced out, but it could happen at any time. Yeah. So that was like a really good explanation of grief for me. Mm -hmm. You know, the ball has gotten smaller. Right. But it still hits those walls and it hurts when it hits. Yeah. But it doesn't hit it as frequently. But yeah, it definitely still hurts real yeah. bad. So, so how, how have you dealt with the grief? Have you seen anyone professionally? Like, how are, how are you, you? I mean, obviously, it's almost two years later. It's a year and a half later now. How have you gotten through this? Have you seen anyone? Like, how, would, how are you holding up this? I'm, I'm hanging in there. I have not seen anyone professionally. You know, I've, I've thought about it and, you know, parts of me really want to. But I do, I do just have my moments and I allow myself those moments okay. that I need to have. And I, I'm and I, I'm okay with that, you know. Yeah. There would be times where I would just avoid it, avoid memories, avoid songs, avoid lots of stuff Mm -hmm. that would bring back those memories because it made me so sad. But now I'm slowly allowing those songs and those memories to just kind of come in and let them do what they do to me, and that's okay. Yeah. Because it's it's okay to still be sad. I'm, yes. I'm gonna be sad probably forever. Yes. But it's it's okay to like let those memories come out. And if they come out via tears, that's okay. Yeah, that's good. I'm just really happy that you're giving yourself that grace and knowing like it's okay. Yeah. And letting yourself feel, letting it come, letting it go. So that's good. Thank you. So one of my me and Casey, we both loved Erica Badu. Like mm. loved her. Like ever since like next lifetime. So, oh, since Baduism, excuse me, since Baduism, mm-hmm. next lifetime was on that album. So that was like in middle school. That was like our our album that we loved to, to sing all the songs together. So throughout our whole like experience, our life experience, like we've been like her whole discography kind of just like goes with all of our our life experiences. And so for probably a good maybe eight or nine months, I couldn't listen to Erica at all. Oh, wow. I couldn't. And like, she's my favorite artist. So I couldn't, I couldn't even hear her songs. The first time I actually got to hear her, Jeff and I had tickets to go to the symphony and she was playing with the symphony. Yes. And it was amazing. And I sat there and she, like, when she first came on, like tears just started rolling down my face. Oh, wow. I'm sure the person immediately next to me was like, what's wrong with her? Right. But they just like started rolling and I could not stop them. And then like Jeff just held my hand. He was like, just let it out. So that gave me like, you know, the ticket to just like let it out Hmm. and it's okay, Hmm. you know? And from then I could slowly listen to more of her songs that reminded me of Casey and reminded me of all of our our fun times. Yeah. Wow. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Is there anything that you've learned from that experience? And um, how are you able to just keep going after that? Well, I mean, I'll say that my daddy was like the life of the party all the time. And, you know, he, like I said, was my inspiration for fashion. He was the person that told me, you know, anything worth having is worth a sacrifice. So knowing that he was so proud of me and everything that I do, every single small or big thing that I did, he was so proud of me that I keep going because I want to continue to make him proud. Oh, you know, that's so sweet. Yeah. So those are the things that kind of keep me going. It keeps pushing me. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, let's get back to your business. So when did you realize that focusing on Greek apparel was your niche and that's where you should focus most of your efforts? So in 2013 was um, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated centennial year because we were founded in 1913. So 2013, I had some sorority sisters that were like, I really wish I had a cardigan that was like, 
really cute. You know, some of the other ones have too much stuff on them. Like, can you can you design us something that's, you know, more subtle and cute and classic? And so I was like, okay, sure. Yeah, I can do that. And so I did. And then I only offered it actually to my chapter that I pledged in at Spellman. So the Ada Kappa chapter, I only really offered it to them. And so maybe like 60 or 70 people ordered. I had my factory make it. And from there, like since they're all in different parts of the country, they all wore them. And then like my phone just started blowing up. Hmm. Like it just snowballed because, you know, people in California saw them and people in D.C. saw them. People, other people in Atlanta saw them. So everyone was like, I want one of those cardigans. How can I get one? How can I get one? So literally after that, I was like, okay, wow, everyone wants a cardigan. So I just started making the cardigan. Mm -hmm. I just started adding that. Okay. And then I added, you know, a couple different, different versions of it and people loved it so much. And then after that, I got calls for lines and groups that wanted me to make things for them to wear to homecoming. So, you know, I was like, sure, I'm down for that. I can do that too. So I would design and produce things just for that group. So say, you know, if you crossed in 2008 and in 2018, it was your 10-year reunion, y'all get back together, y'all go to homecoming, y'all want to look real cute together. And so then you call me and I would create something for your group and your line. And people just started doing that more often. I got so many orders. Literally, that's really what makes my business so profitable is like these Greek orders. And then I'm design I'm still designing stuff that, you know, is really kind of chic and very flattering. So that definitely in itself is a different thing than what most other Greek apparel vendors offer. And fashion forward. Yeah. So we're doing something. We're doing a little leather peplum. We're doing some like off the shoulder sweatshirt, something mm-hmm. that's really like kind of really unique. And another thing, since I have my own manufacturer, I offer sizes that are all inclusive. So I offer like extra small up to like 5X. Mm. So like if you've got a really tiny line sister and a really big line sister that y'all can all wear the same thing and not miss a beat. That's awesome. And everybody look cute and feel cute. Exactly. Yes. And that's what we want to do. So um, so then after that, I just was like, okay, well, I'm going to expand this. So I actually at that point went and I got licensed with the organization because that's kind of what you're really supposed to do. If you're going to sell it, you have to be licensed so that you can use their their trademark, you know, properly. So I got licensed, which was really expensive to do. And it's something I have to pay for like all every year. So that mm. that's a whole thing. And the first the first show that we did, my husband came with me and we did a show in San Antonio. It was actually before we had the twins and like we sold so much stuff. It was like we had like lines, people just lining up. Wow. It was like so crazy. Like, y'all really want all this stuff that I'm, that just this, <laughs> like that I designed, really? Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. It was so amazing to see people just, number one, lining up for my stuff and just two, like designing stuff for people who are so passionate about the sorority. You know, Delta, I'm, you know, it's a love of mine. So, Designing is something I'm really particular about every single detail that I put into it. Right. The fabric has to be perfect. The stitches have to be perfect. The buttons need to be perfect. Like, I'm not half stepping on any of this stuff because it represents something so special to so many people right. that it has to be perfect. Yes. Yeah. I love that. So, what advice do you have for people that want it all? What do you have to do to maintain a full time job? a side business, and a family? I would say know what you want. Give yourself some grace. Allow yourself to say no when you need to. And know that you don't have to do it all. Mm. Not all at once. Not all at the same time. Some days, I'm just a mother. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Some days, I'm like full-time, like busy entrepreneur. Right. And that's okay. Most days I can't I'm I'm always a mom for sure, but most days like you just can't 
expect to be every single thing to every single person and be 100%. And you have to allow yourself, you know, not to have to do that. Right. And I mean, obviously, you find a way to delegate. Yes. Like delegation seems like a big thing for you. Yes. Delegation, delegation, delegation. I recently hired two more assistants um, since Chandler moved to Atlanta and started her whole um, new life. I hired two more assistants and I really allowed, actually, I'm sorry, I hired four assistants. Yeah, I'm going to say it's a little short. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. (laughs) I hired four assistants. Um, So I hired them to, in order to get a lot of things off my plate. You know, I had a friend that told me, she told me a story about a lady that had a dog walking business and she walked all these dogs. She had, a, you know, her business was steady growing and growing and she had more dogs and more dogs. And then once she hired someone to help walk the dogs and she stopped walking the dogs, then her business tripled. Mm. So I told myself, I have to stop walking these dogs. Oh, amen. <laughs> yes. So I hired four assistants to help me walk the dog okay. because I cannot do it all. I have people that will, you know, that ship the orders, that do customer service now, someone that helps with the production, someone that's helping with marketing and social media, which have been all so good. Now, I'm still very particular about the way I want all this this stuff done. And that's just being an entrepreneur. You have to be. And how did you find those people? Um, I put an ad on, out on Indeed. Hmm. Okay. So that was really successful, highly, highly successful. And I got maybe 60 or 70 applications. And I looked at my husband and I was talking to my husband. I was like, these people want to work for me. Like, why, why do they want to work for me? <laughs> you know? And, and my husband was like, you just, you need to own this. Like, he's like, yeah, they want to work up, for you. Girl. Yeah. He's Boss like, up, of sis. course. Why wouldn't they want to work for you? Yes. And I was like, yeah, they want to work for me. Mm-hmm. For sure. They want to work for me. So. And then, and also, In the conversation of delegation, what do you delegate out within your house life, your child care, your cleaning service, or how do you handle all that? Because you can't do all that. You got a big old house. Oh, yes. Yes. So, yeah, we have a cleaning service that comes frequently um, so that you just got to pay for it. So, I mean, there's things that you have to do. And then as my 11-year-old is kind of just growing and wanting more responsibility, you know, in, you know, getting phones and iPads and earbuds, AirPods, whatever they're called. Like she's wanting more stuff that's right. more expensive. So now she has to do more stuff around the house, right. you know? So her chores are kind of, kind of cranked up a little up bit. Yeah. Up. yeah. So, you know, that kind of helps out a lot too. I have somewhat you know, a schedule for the housework that the daily housework that gets done, Mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of keeps us on task and keeps like the dishes out of the sink and keeps, you know, the clothes clean. But as long as everyone does their part, Mm -hmm. you know, my husband's really good about, you know, in the morning he, he gets the twins up and he changes diapers and puts their clothes on for the day. Mm. I have to leave them out for him because otherwise they look... (laughs) A hot mess. Oh, no. (laughs) But, um, no, I leave the clothes out. But he puts their clothes on, gets them all dressed. And then, you know, so that's less for me to have to do. In the morning, trying to go to work. Yeah, because then I all I have to do is, you know, brush teeth, do hair, get shoes on, which does not sound like a lot, but it's a lot when you have two little people that don't really want that stuff done. Yeah, no, that's a <laughs> lot going on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that takes us a good amount of time to get all that stuff done and then out the door. But it's you know it's a big help that he gets it started. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. So with all of that and how busy your life is at this point, what do you feel that you have sacrificed in your life? Like what used to be a part of your life that you're kind of like I don't got time anymore. Like. Do you travel often? Like, what has, what has, what's had to fall off from your old life to make sure that you are spending time with your children, your husband, and managing all of your businesses? I'll say, unfortunately, my social 
life has like sacrificed tremendously the most. A lot of my friends are are still single, so they do things that are different than what I would do anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I do miss like sometimes having a brunch or a lunch or, and those things I really just don't have a lot of time for. Right. Because I've got to get back. And and it's not that I can't make the time. Sometimes I just, I just want to be with my kids, you know, and, and that's just the sacrifice that kind of comes with it. Luckily for me, I am blessed to have some friends that just don't give me any grief about it. And they just really understand, like you, mm-hmm. <laughs> they just really kind of get it. And they're like, you know, okay, I see she's she's doing this and and that's what it is. So I'm I'm thankful for that. I am slowly getting back into, you know, doing some things that are more social, um, like with what we've started with the boss and her crown. So so tell me about um, A Boss and Her Crown. How did this come up and what is the vision for this? So A Boss and Her Crown is a group that I started with two of my other friends, Randy Yarrell and Dot Smith Moore. They are both moms and entrepreneurs. Randy runs the Landry and also Ray Lawson, which is a full service design and event planning company. And Dot runs her Styled by Dot, which is a closet purging, closet organization, event styling. She does it all, basically. So she's just a wardrobe consultant. So um, those two friends are super, super powerful and really motivated in being entrepreneurs. And so I just brought the idea to both of them that, you know, we've all got a lot of different networks of friends that are entrepreneurs, why aren't we doing more to get them together? We need to have them together and kind of cross-populate. You know, every time I'm with any of my friends, I'm always like, oh, you should do this. Or have you thought about doing this? Like, it's just a natural conversation with my friends because we're all, we're all entrepreneurs. And so there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing this on a larger scale to really kind of help each other with resources and you know, a lot of other communities do this kind of thing with each other. And and I, I'll say just for Black women, there's not enough of us uplifting one another as there should be. You know, everyone's, a lot of people are just kind of focused on themselves and getting themselves to a destination. But um, why not if you can help someone get there faster? Like, let's, let's pull our resources. Mm, yes. So we started A Boss in Her Crown, which is just a networking group that, we started last December, December 2019, and we just have um, periodic events for for our group of women. And we started out with a brunch, and that was really successful. I mean, people left feeling super inspired and, you know, exchanging ideas, exchanging information. So we really got a lot of people together to, you know, just come up with great inspirational advice for one another. So we're so appreciative and thankful that we had such a great turnout. And then this year, we've got a lot of stuff planned. So we are just like going full force into like planning mode of everything that we're doing. We we had a movie night in January. We're planning to do a sip and scrap event in March. And then in May and June, we've got other events planned. So it's jam-packed. So we are luckily bringing a lot of stuff and a lot of interesting and exciting things to our networks. That's great. Yeah, I attended both events and I must say that the brunch was spectacular. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful, very well executed. I really enjoyed myself and really enjoyed meeting all of the other women that were part of the networks of Randy and Dot that I did not know because Mm -hmm. I pretty much knew most of your um, network as I've been your friend for years. But you know, meeting these other women was super inspirational and it was just a great time connecting with other women. It was all great energy and oh, good yes. vibes. It was like, such good vibes. Like that's like stuff you can't even pay for. Like no. it was such good vibes and people were super honest and open and you know, they wanted to share, which I was honestly I was afraid that, you know, people were gonna be quiet and no one wanted to say anything, but Like, we had to tell people to be quiet. (laughs) No, like, people were ready to talk. It was great. It was great. It was really, really great. So we are excited to bring all of our 2020 events to everyone because 
we have a lot to share and there's no reason why we can't all get there, you know, together. Right. So what is your vision for your future in all aspects? And um, just what's up next for you? So I am going to, number one, continue to be the best mommy and wife that I can be. That is my number one goal and, you know, just my number one thing that I want to continue to do and and be. I just want to be better at both and be very just intentional about the time that I'm spending with my family and the quality of experiences that I'm providing with them, you know, Mm -hmm. so that we have, we're doing stuff, you know. So that's my number one goal. And then I want to grow Sacred Heart Collections. Sacred Heart Collections is continuously growing. Right now we have been licensed for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We are licensed for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And we recently just got licensed for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. So we've got three sororities that I am um, now licensed for. So I will be selling my products and merchandise at different events that are coming up. I have some, I have a luncheon coming up in February. I have some conventions in June and July. So this year is already like packing up. So I'm hoping that I can sell more product, obviously, and continue to grow the business even more. Awesome. And so of that, I mean, obviously you already have a lot of things in motion mm-hmm. for 2020. Oh, yes. Are there any like overall like dead set like goals that you are like, hey, by 2020, by the end of 2020, this or that, like what else can we expect from you in 2020? I don't necessarily tell myself I have to do something by X, Y, and Z date mm-hmm. only because for me, Sometimes that inhibits me or prohibits me from actually getting that done. So I like to give myself some time to do what I have to do. Unless there's like an event, there's events and stuff. I those obviously have to be done by a certain date. But I want to definitely have a new collection come out. I want to sell more product. I want to reach more people. I want to get some brand reps in different cities and mm. different states. That's something that I actually am really focused on working on this year. So I don't put like a hard and fast rule around it has to be done by December 31st. But, you know, I know by next, by 2021, I need to have all these people set up with their own setups that they can go sell the product. Nice. So you just really set intentions and yes. do what you need to do to work towards them. You don't set these hard stops. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for absolutely. sharing that. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, when you set that hard stop for a particular goal, Number one, I think some goals need hard stops, but I think for really big stretch goals, I think you have to give yourself and allow yourself the time to implement it and execute it. Otherwise, if you don't get a part of it done, then you kind of just say, okay, I'm not going to do it. Mm. Otherwise, I mean, I'd rather be late and done right. than, you know, not do it at all. Right. What business resources, apps, software, et cetera, or even even devices or things that you've bought that you use and you find most helpful and beneficial in your business that you can recommend to the Fashionista Yogi community? So my favorite app is Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. It is an outsourcing resource that I literally outsource everything. So you know, if I have a logo that needs to be done or, you know, a lot of times I do these, uh, I take pictures of my clothes and then someone else from Fiverr will create what we call a ghost mannequin. So it looks like it's like a mannequin, but empty. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So someone does those for me and those are, those are great product shots, you know, I actually had someone here in Dallas do a shoot with them and it cost me over $250 just for like six or seven products. Mm -hmm. But it literally cost me $20 from Fiverr. Is it like they are creating a look 
like a a, a fake three D moment. Yes, it's like a fake three D okay. moment with no actual body. It's just the garments look like three D. Correct. Okay. So basically, they take a picture of the garment. Well, I take a picture of the garment on a mannequin, mm-hmm. and then they kind of like take the mannequin out. Okay, basically, yeah, kind of Photoshop the mannequin out. Exactly. So the three D element already comes from the photograph that you already took on the mannequin. Exactly. Got it. But they make it look so nice and so professional that. You can't even tell. You can't even tell. Okay. You it, you can't tell. So just things like that that I, I outsource. But you can outsource literally anything from Fiverr. They do email marketing campaigns for me that I've had them build and change over my website. I've had them go through my database of customers and segment which customer bought which sorority's items so I can target that specific group for you know mark email marketing. So. Literally things that would take me weeks to do, someone can do it in 24 hours. Oh, wow. For $10. Oh, wow. So it's great. It's like my favorite thing to do. I have like something from, I have something on order from Fiverr like every week. Amazing. Thank you for that. And then my favorite like hardware slash software thing that I just bought, which I'm slightly obsessed with, is called My Cloud Home. And don't get it confused with iCloud, but it's called My Cloud Home. And it is a server device that you plug into your router. I'm also kind of a techie. You are. Yeah, I'm a yes. techie. But it's a server device you plug into your router, your internet router. And basically, you can put all of your files on this My Cloud Home. And so it acts as a you know, cloud-based server. And you can also have that app on your phone and you can also log in from another remote location and access all your files. Mm. So, which is really cool because most people pay Google Drive or iCloud for that. Right. Like monthly. Yeah. But if you have static files that live on this um, My Cloud home, then you can access them remotely from anywhere. Oh, girl. I know. Look into that. It's Thank amazing. you, sis. I know. It's amazing. It was like $100, maybe $40 for four terabytes. Oh. And I, it's it's so good. Oh. It's so good to have because, you know, you could be out somewhere and someone's like, oh, I need that file for X, Y, and Z. And then you got to wait till you get home and you yeah, know. look for your hard drive exactly. and all that. But, oh, wow. That's an amazing yeah. resource. Thank I know, you. I love that. Okay, anything else? Um, let's see. Those are my biggest things um that I that I use frequently, you okay. know. As a designer, you know, you, you always use Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop, but um those those things that I have just talked about really kind of like amplify my design business. Good, make things easier for you. Create some hacks. And the same question regarding managing all of the things in your life, any shared apps, um, things with your husband, for example, if there's any shared calendars or lists or any family um, planning, organizational hacks that helps you be a better working mom and keep your stuff together. So as techie as I am, I am such a paper list maker. Oh, really? Yeah. I cannot <laughs> do to-do lists on the phone and apps. I can't. They, they just don't. They don't work for you. They don't work for me. I'm not, fu- I'm not fulfilled when I cross that off the list. Okay. But when I actually physically cross something off my list, then, then yes, I feel fulfilled. So my husband and I don't share that, and he definitely doesn't the share the love of organization as okay. I do. <laughs> so, no. Okay. But I do have a a tool planner, T-U-L, that I recently bought for 2020 that I have just been putting, marking everything down, got my calendars kind of set and, you know, writing everything down that I have planned out. So that is kind of the thing that I use to keep me organized. Okay. And then I make my to-do list for the week. I am a actual to-do list, a physical to-do list person. So I make them every single week and I try to get through them, but I try to make them so that they are reasonable and realistic. Mm-hmm. So I'm not putting too much stuff on myself to get done in a week. Yeah. Kind of time block it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that I can actually fulfill everything that I wanted to do. Um, and then one other thing that I do just like as, you know, as an email person, a lot of times on Gmail, you know, there's the starred 
kind of, mm-hmm. you know, thing. So all the things that I need to do, or if, if it's an email that I need to kind of react to, or there's an action needed from me, I star it. And that's kind of like my running list for the week as well. Right. So that'll keep me like, you know, keep me on top of the things that need to get done so I can clear out that starred list. Mm. So that kind of keeps me organized with in my email, that's which awesome. is also another reason why I don't like when people text me about, oh, yeah, about your business. Yeah. Because you can't keep tr- track of it in one place. I can't keep track of it in one place. And then I forget and then I look rude. <laughs> right. And they're on you. Yeah. So the other day, we and our... One of our group threads, because as we have many together. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you asked the opinion about songs that describe your life, if you can make your songs for your life soundtrack. Uh-huh. Let's discuss those songs, what they are, and why you chose them. Okay, so initially I wanted to use Nuck If You Buck. <laughs> Yes. Like Crime Mob because I was in a mood at that time. But honestly, that probably wouldn't be the best song for my soundtrack of my whole life. Right. So um, we settled on I Am Every Woman by Whitney Houston. Yes. And we chose that one because, you know, I am I am every woman. I am a mom. I am a wife. I am a sister. I'm a daughter. I am just doing the best I can to be the best person I can possibly be and the best to all those relationships. So, you know, I'm I'm a hard worker and I'm mm-hmm. going to do my best to be, you know, the best I can be. So that's why I am every woman. Yes. And then we chose So Fresh and So Clean by Outkast because I like to stay dressed. I like to look cute. You know, I feel like if you look cute. You can be confident. You can confidently sell whatever product you're trying to sell, whether that's yourself, your business, your product. So I like to look really cute. And it honestly does make me feel good about myself. Some people some people like food. Some people like clothes. Some <laughs> right. people like, like, I like to look cute. I like yes. to make myself up. I like my hair to be cute. I like my nails to be done. That's just what I like. Yeah. So um, I'm so fresh and so clean. And then lastly, Diva by Beyonce, because a diva is a female version of a hustler. And that's, that's what I am. I'm a hustler. I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I'm a boss. So yes. that's why we selected Diva. And it couldn't be better for, like, who I am and my journey. Yes. What are your daily wellness routines or rituals that you do to keep your mind right, keep your sanity together? What can't you go without to keep yourself grounded and level-headed? Prayer, number one. Prayer is like the first and last thing I do every day. That kind of keeps me at least going into the day with a positive mind. Um, Number two is just practicing optimism and positive thinking. Hoping and thinking that people generally mean well. Mm -hmm. Assuming um, positive intent. And assume, assuming positive intent. Because once you do that, then at least you give people the benefit of the doubt. If I automatically jump to the negative conclusion, then I'm going to pop off at somebody. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. Right. So I'm going to assume positive intent. Everyone's not always meaning well. But yeah. for the most part, if you assume positive intent, then your reaction can be a little bit more tamed or level-headed. Right. And then lastly, I actually have a reminder on my phone that says be present. Mm. Um, And it happens around 8 o'clock. A.M. P.M. P.M. So when I'm at home with my kids, we're all like there. Okay. It it tells me to just be present. A little nudge, they call that. Yeah, a little Mm -hmm. nudge like, hey, just be present. Like, don't be all in your phone. You know, looking at Instagram, looking at Facebook, looking at your emails, like just be present for a moment. Mm. Like, stop. Um, I can't say that I'm like really, really like hard and fast about that at that time, at that very moment, but at least like it's a little nudge for me to like remember Remember. to stop. This is my time to be with my children and my Mm -hmm. husband. Yeah. Do you have any specific, like a lot of, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs say, you know, they have a specific morning routine. Um, Do you? I, I don't have a specific morning routine. 
And that's primarily because I am an entrepreneur and I work in a corporate office. Mm -hmm. So I can't really, I can't really start my day off with my Sacred Heart business. But I did hear a podcast that said to, you know, if you are a full-time entrepreneur, to segment your days and your times up so that you're not just doing the tasks of the business all day, every day. Mm -hmm. So you have a time in the morning from like nine to 10 where you are setting up social media for the whole week. Mm -hmm. From 11 to 12, you are, I'm just making this up, only doing um, sales analysis, Mm -hmm. you know? So if I were full-time entrepreneurship, then absolutely, I would have my days segmented out so that I can I could do that. Otherwise, I could see myself getting really lost in all the tasks of the mm-hmm. business, right? Like just getting through all the emails, right? Aside from like, otherwise, you can just segment those out, and you know, you get through ten as opposed mm-hmm. to all twenty. That's going to take you all day, right? I actually am asking that question about a morning routine more from a wellness perspective. Oh, from a wellness perspective and mental health. Yes. So literally that is taking a few moments before I get out of bed to like say my prayers and be thankful that I have woken up, that I'm alive, that I can get the chance to start a new day. So it's just like a moment of like gratitude. Nice. I love that. Do you work out? I do. Okay. Well, and you do. I do Camp Gladiator, which I am like the last person you would think would be doing something like a boot camp. But one of my coworker friends who I really, really love, she is like super fit and like into all this wellness and I don't know, like collagen water and stuff like, and she's super into everything, right? It's Jill. Yeah, Jill. So her and another friend were like, oh, we're going to start Camp Gladiator next month. Do you want to join? And literally, I thought it was a joke because they know I don't like to do stuff like that. But I kind of said, okay, I guess I could do it. Right. And then I started in September and I'm still doing it. You are? I'm still doing it. That's awesome. I'm so proud of you. So when do you do it? I do it on Monday nights and Wednesday nights. That's when my mother comes over to help me with the twins. Okay. So she, during that time, she gives them a bath. Well, she feeds them dinner. She gives them a bath. She reads them a book, gets them ready for the day, the you know the evening the and the day next day. Gets all their bottled, like their sippy cups ready for the next day, like so I can just pull them out of the fridge and just go. Mm-hmm. She's got everything down and she'll like even wash a few dishes, maybe fold some clothes. Like she's bummed. Like I'm so grateful for her. So she does all that on a Monday or Wednesday and I get to go work out. And that's right after work. That's right after work, yeah. Okay. And are you able to leave the twins in daycare while you do that? No, I come home. Huh? I come home first. Yes. You come home? Yep. Okay. I come, I come home first. Camp Gladiator is like all over the whole city, okay. like all over many cities. And so they have one by my house. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Like five minutes away from my house. Okay. And they do it, this particular class is at 745. Oh, okay. So it's a later class. Okay. Which is good and bad because it's not that many people. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a private training session. Okay. So it might be like four people. Are you doing it with Jeff or just you? Okay. So funny story. He's going to kill me for saying this, but funny story. Jeff started out the same day as I did. We both did the trial. And so he went and I went and we were both working out and like, we were doing it and he was like so out of breath and like <laughs> <laughs> sad vibe. Yeah, he was like so out of breath. And then he was like, you know, he was like, these older ladies were like, tell me, come on, Jeff, come on, baby, you could do it, you could do it. And he oh, was like, shit. totally crushed his ego. He was like, How are these old ladies <laughs> doing this? And I can't do it. And then like he asked me afterward, he was like, So he was like, you're not, you're not sore. And I was like, a little bit, you know? And he was like, you weren't pushing yourself hard enough. Uh-uh. I was like, no, sir. Like, why are you sir. hating? <laughs> hating, yes, sir. So um, he said he was never going back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, literally, I do this by myself, so. Okay. We did, but no. Um, 
What style and beauty tips do you have for your fellow fashionistas that want it all? How is it possible to take care of all of these people and businesses and corporate job and yourself and still remain fly and put together? Where do you find the time? What are some hacks to being faster? While I love how I looked with the lash extensions, I had to give those up because they took too much time out of my busy schedule. Tell me about it. I had to let it go. (laughs) Yeah. So I was, you know, it was just too hard to schedule. And then it was just too, too much. Although I will say that like lash nap was like the best nap I could ever get, you know. (laughs) Touche. So I don't do those anymore, but on like a busy, like on a, like a special night, I will do a strip lash, which is totally fine Mm -hmm. um, with the lash glue. So I'm, I'm good with those. For nails, I I like to get my my nails done. I do like a moment when I can get them done. I found a place, you know, that's a little off the beaten path. That's not like one of the really fancy, you know, chandelier, flat screen type of places. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit. It's not raggedy at all, but they just don't have as many customers. They're just not that popular. And I think because it's not as a new of an establishment as some of the you know, grand. Mm-hmm. nail places. Anyway, I go there on my lunch break. Oh, really? And they're able to get me in and out. Oh. And like, it's not that expensive. So that's better than the yeah. grand places. It's going to take two hours. Yeah. Also, I will say for a moment, I was doing press-ons. No shame in my game. Mm-hmm. There are some really cute press-ons. Mm. So on a moment that I can't get to the nail salon and I need my nails done for a presentation or, you know, an event or something... I will do some press-ons, and they'll last for a good seven to ten days mm-hmm. with glue. And I got a lot of compliments on my last press-ons. Nice. Hair, I actually, if I don't go to Supercuts, I actually have a really great hairstylist that will come to my house nice. to do my hair. Costs a little bit extra, but, I mean, it's really convenient for me mm-hmm. not to have to go into a salon, wait, wait, get my hair done, wait, you know. So it takes the Mm four-hour visit down to like a two-hour kind of thing, which is perfect. So yeah, pay for that convenience. And that's pretty much it. Is there any hacks that you have wardrobe-wise? The getting dressed faster? How do you pick your look out quickly? Because you always have some kind of eclectic look, I feel like. (laughs) And look very put together. So I'm just kind of like, girl, how do you come up with this every day? Well, you know, I don't. I don't put it together at night or anything. What I do is when I get up, I ask Alexa what the weather's like. And then in the shower, I'm thinking of, okay, I could wear, you know, it's a sweatshirt and, you know, ripped jeans type of day, or it's like, you know, a blouse and tights type of day, Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm thinking of what I have to do that day, what my meetings consist of, what events I have that day. And so then I'm pulling putting it together in my mind as I'm getting dressed. Yeah, we have the same process then because I have a hard time doing it at night uh, personally. Because I just don't know how I'm going to feel. No, and I definitely do it based off my feelings. Yeah. What book has been most influential in your life? I mean, the Bible, of course, is an influential book. Mm -hmm. Um, Even inspiring, anything that's helped you with your business, any game changers. You read a book and it really gave you some, some motivation to do something differently. Nothing you can think of? mm Okay. Any podcasts or YouTube channels that you consume that are mo- very helpful in your life? Yes. So I am a very big podcaster. Um, I probably would be a bigger book person if I found the right book, the audio book, because I spend so much time in the car. But podcasts, I like. Um, she did it her way. I, I like her. Yeah, I like her. I like Side Hustle Pro. Love her. Yep. And then I like How I Built This. How I Built This has got by far my favorite podcast to listen to. So inspiring. Yeah, so inspiring. And it's like, you could do this. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are my favorite like entrepreneurship podcasts to listen to. And then aside from, you know, being a, a techie and a scientist and a mom, then I'm really interested in true crime. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that stuff. That's so funny. So interested in true crime. So criminal and um, any of the serial series have been like my favorite ones to listen to. I love to like hear about people and getting murdered. Oh my and, like, God. Figuring it out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, who inspires you the most? It could be a celebrity. It could be some 
one gone and passed. It could be your mama. It could be Beyonce. Well, I mean, it's funny you say that because my parents definitely are truly inspirational. You know, my daddy was like just an awesome, amazing person. So I'm inspired by him and the legacy that he left me and just continue to make him proud. I'm inspired by my mom because she's just like so genuine and thoughtful and sweet. And she's just like, is so generous and giving to anyone. She'll give like anything to anyone. Yeah. Fun fact, she actually thought that she won the lottery a couple of years ago. Like really, she thought, she really thought that she won the lottery and maybe like five or six years ago. Um, turns out it was not a winning ticket, but in her process of like celebration, she had already talked about like who she was going to give money to. Oh. If it would have been me, I would have been like, okay, I'm going to buy this. I'm right. going to buy it. We're going to go on a cruise. We're going on a vacation in the south of France. Right. Like, I'm automatically thinking about what we're about to do. And she was, her first initial thought was like, who she's going to help first. Oh. How much money she's going to give to like, you know, these cousins or these relatives or whatever. So she's just so thoughtful. And, mm. I, and I feel like people should just be more generous in giving like her. No. It's very sweet. Yeah. Too bad she didn't win the lottery, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I'm working out, honestly, I'm truly inspired by Beyonce. Like, okay. those are that's actually what I think about when I'm, like, running and I'm, like, I want to quit. I really want to quit. And I'm, like, you cannot look like Beyonce if you quit. <laughs> you cannot. So keep going. Good. Um, and what drives you to keep going and excites you the most about life? Thinking about seeing my children grow up and watching my children just grow and become who they are destined to be, that motivates me to be the best person I can be and make my business thrive because I want to have something to leave to them. I want, number one, to have the flexibility to have time and create experiences with them, mm -hmm. number one. And then number two, I want to have a legacy to live to leave with them so that they can choose to be business owners or run this business right. or do something. You know, right. I want to give them some sort of generational wealth. Yes. I love that. What are you most grateful for at this moment? My family. My family, 100%. My husband is an amazing person. He's so smart. He's so driven. He's so just like, he's amazing. You know, and he loves me. He loves me so much. I'm mm -hmm. just like, I'm so grateful. Because like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I look so ugly. But he loves me still. Mm -hmm. um, and my kids, you know, um, you know, Chloe is, is growing up. And I am still someone that she really looks up to. to right. And I love that. You know, mm -hmm. I love that she wants to go to Spelman. I yes. love that she wants to be a Delta. I love that she wants to be a fashion designer. So I'm so grateful that she sees something in me that, number one, she can achieve. Yes. And number two, that she's just, like, proud of. Yes. So I'm grateful that we have that relationship. Um, and then the twins, you know, I'm, I am so grateful that they are happy and healthy and just, like, thriving and learning. It's so fun to see them interact with each other. Yeah. And they're so sweet to one another. Like, yeah. they fight a lot. But yeah. at the same time, like, they're so sweet. Yesterday, Jeff and I went two separate ways with each child. He mm -hmm. went to get a haircut with Noah. And I took Marley to the fabric store. And she was like, where did Noah go? Oh. She's like, where, where are we going without him? Oh. And, like, sometimes Noah will go and we have a drawer full of fruit snacks, of course. And so he'll go and he'll bring back two. Oh. And... Not for himself. He'll bring back one, you know, for Marley and one for himself, which is so sweet. And I don't even think that you can teach that no. kind of thing. So I'm so glad that he has it. Oh, that's so sweet. And so do you have any last words of wisdom for the Fascinating Yogi community and how to have it all? Well, I would say be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. And I'm still learning how to do that. You know, I'm still learning how to just be grateful, be gracious, 
know that this is meant for me. I I am good enough to have this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm good enough for people to want to work for me. I'm good enough to do this. So I say, be kind to yourself, be grateful, know that you are good enough and you're worthy of every opportunity that lands in your lap because it would not be there otherwise. I would say, take your time and again, learn the power of no. Say no when you have to, because it literally will, it, your health depends on it. Your wellness depends on it. So you have to say no. Um, and lastly, just be present. Be present with your family, with your friends, with your business. Be present. Be in the moment. Take in um, the things that you're, you are experiencing so that you can enjoy them and you can really just have them. You know, you have to be present. Um, and then lastly, I'll say, you know, like my daddy said all the time, anything worth having is worth a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So there will be sacrifices that you have to make and they will be worth it. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. And where can people find you if they want to contact you or follow up on your content? Okay. Um, on Instagram, I am at Sacred Heart Co. That's S A C R E D H E A R T C O. And then um, my website is sacredheartcollections.com. And you can find me there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brandy. I appreciate you for coming on to interview with me and for your friendship. Oh, and of course. I'm grateful for your friendship. Oh, this has been like really a meaty interview. I never expected that it would last this long. <laughs> I knew it was going to be long, but I definitely think didn't think it was going to go as long, but I really feel like you just gave so much value to listeners and I just am so appreciative of you doing this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Such an amazing interview. I'm so thankful Brandy sat down to give us all of that info and inspiration. What a beautiful spirit she is. I really hope that you all enjoyed her as much as I did. In the next episode, my cousin and owner of Living Free Souls and founder of Herbally Free will join me for an interview. She is one of my health and wellness warriors who has been such an amazing light in my life as I have been navigating my way through this rheumatoid arthritis journey over the last four years. Please tune in to see what she has to say and what she's all about. She's an amazing spirit and you won't want to miss out on what she has to say. I invite you to subscribe to the show and to please spread the word to anyone who you think may be interested in this podcast. I also invite you to head over to runwaytoreiki.com and join the email list to stay up to date on all things Runway to Reiki, including future shows, guests, events, giveaways, and collaborations. Please follow at Runway to Reiki Podcast on Instagram and Runway to Reiki Podcast on Facebook as well. For those of you who may be interested in starting to practice yoga, please feel free to contact me through the contact form at fashionistayogi.com. I'm currently offering virtual private lessons. I'm mainly focusing on teaching modified yoga to people who also have rheumatoid arthritis like myself, but I am also teaching virtual modified yoga to beginners as well. I'm currently not offering a virtual weekly class that's open to all. I'm only teaching private lessons, which people can split the cost if you'd like to take private lessons with a small group or create your own class. I'm considering creating some weekly classes that are open to all. I'd love your feedback. If you want to hit me up on the contact form at fashionistayogi.com, and let me know if that's something you would be interested in. I'm working on launching a membership site focused on teaching yoga for people with RA and other injuries. I'm currently conducting interviews over Zoom to get potential user feedback so that when I launch the membership site, it's what the users truly want and need. If you are interested or know anyone that may be interested, please contact me on the contact form at fashionistayogi.com. There is also some Fashionista merchandise, Fashionista Yogi merchandise on the Fashionista Yogi website. If you want to check that out, I'd appreciate your support. And please also be sure to follow at Fashionista Yogi if you are interested in keeping up with my yoga teaching journey on Instagram and Fashionista Yogi on Facebook as well. Be sure to sign up for the email list on the website, fashionistayogi.com, if you'd like to stay up to date on my yoga business. Lastly, I do offer product consulting services, mainly in apparel. If you have an idea about starting a product and have no idea where to start, 
I love helping people bring their visions to life. I can work with you on getting your vision executed, or we can schedule a pick my brain call where you can pay a small fee to have a call time with me to ask me all of your questions you may have about starting a product line, whether it's a clothing line or some other product where you could use answers from a designer who's worked with many factories for many years. Please send me a message on the contact form at runwaytoreiki.com for further inquiries on fashion design consulting services. Thank you again for tuning in to this third episode of Runway to Reiki. I'm so excited that you all are on this journey with me and I thank you so much for your support on this new adventure and blessings to you all.